Buonasera a tutti. Good evening and welcome to the Italian Radio Hour. Io sono Viviana and I would like to welcome back our regular listeners and also welcome any new listeners. Also, be sure to like us on Instagram and Facebook at Italian Radio Hour and subscribe to our YouTube channel to catch up on any past video interviews. Vorrei dare il benvenuto ai nostri ascoltatori da tutto il mondo. Grazie per essere con noi anche oggi mentre continuiamo il nostro viaggio per l'Italia e la cultura italiana. So today we'll have a very special be- uh, guest who is actually taking time from her beautiful birthday celebration. Uh, and uh, specifically, I'm referring to Marianne Corneti, who is a celebrating American mezzo-soprano known for her commanding stage presence and intense portrayals of dramatic mezzo-soprano roles. With a career spanning several decades, she has captivated audiences all over the world in iconic roles like Mary Sinaida, Azucena in Il Trovatore, and Eboli in Don Carlo. Her voice, rich and powerful and emotive, has made her a favorite in the works of Verdi Wagner and other composers known to their challenge, for their challenging roles. Today, Marianne will share some of her uh, career uh, milestones, but also maybe give us some advice on uh, new artists entering this beautiful world. So sit back and relax, don't go anywhere. I'm a prima pubblicità. Parli italiano? Do you want to learn, improve or master your Italian? Istituto Mondo Italiano can help. Located in the heart of Region Square, Mondo Italiano offers small group classes and one-on-one private tutoring, in person or online, to help you learn Italian in no time. Visit us online at istitutomondoitaliano.org. Uh, benvenuta Marianne e buon compleanno. It's great grazie, to have you. Marianne, grazie, un grande piacere per me. Oh. Thank you so much. <laughs> now we could uh, we could definitely have this conversation all in Italian. We'll be talking about your many skills, including being a multilingual. And um, you and I have met in person a few months ago. And uh, um, and now we are up to something, not that I have much dealing to do with it, but uh, um, you will be on stage at the Pittsburgh Opera uh, in just a week or so. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, your role in there. But I think our audience who already knows you, but let's start from the very beginning. Okay. People like to hear the story. So first of all, you know that I have to ask, you know, your connection, you know, Marianne Corneti or Cornetti, which will make me hungry right off the bat. (laughs) Marianne Corneti, yes. (laughs) There you go. Or maybe you were blessed with eternal fortune, right? The little, the little Cornetto, the little. Um, Tell us a little little bit about your um, background um, and people that inspire you to enter the world of music and maybe you grew up in a musical uh, family. So tell us a little bit about your family. Uh, with great pleasure, let me tell you. Uh, I came, my mom and dad, uh, uh, my mother was Irish and my father was Italian. And uh, I, my Italian side of the family, my grandparents were from Lago di Como and Torino mm-hmm. and North. And so, uh, my mom and dad, uh, you know, have this had this great combination of Italian and Irish. So we always said, I have the testa dura of the Irish, <laughs> but the romantic part of the Italians. <laughs> but the Italians so, are not a hard headed uh, too. But I think that he yeah. meant also your performance, your vibrance on stage, right? <laughs> oh, 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 temperamento io. <laughs> I have a lot. But... Um, <laughs> I, I was blessed to have, um, a, on my mother's side, a, a very long, long line of uh, musical talent clear from my great, great grandmother, wow. grandmothers. And so it came down the line. My, grand, my grandmother could rock a piano and sing, and she played in church for more than 60 years. Wow. Uh, and then it, of course, came down to my, my mother. Uh, and my mother came from a family of nine children. And, you know, they were they were very, very, very poor. And what they had was their music. And their music kept them going. Um, they didn't probably know how 
poor they were because they music was just a part of the family. Every Sunday, when I was a kid growing up, we would go to my grandmother's. And there was singing and dancing and probably too much drinking and <laughs> all of that coming from the Irish side. But uh, it was it was something that was a part of our family. And my mother was very proud uh, that she wanted to teach her children. My mother could also, she sang, she was on the radio early in her childhood uh, with her sister uh, singing on the radio uh, with guitar and and they harmonizing together. But my mother also was a, she could play the piano and the organ and she loved music. And so, um, my mother instilled that music into my brothers and I. Um, my mother was very, very happy to say when I was four years old that uh, she was very proud to say that Marianne could sing all the words to supercalifragilisticexpialidocious at the age of four. So <laughs> that was part of a, a, you know, our just everyday life. And Viviana, the thing that I have said many, many times throughout my career is I was blessed with really wonderful teachers. And it's so important that teachers, uh, they can make you, they can break you. That's, I mean, that is just a fact. And when you have good ones, they can really uh, um, help you and nurture you. And, and in the sixth grade, I had a, a chorus teacher that said, I would like you to sing a solo in the, the sixth grade uh, uh, spring concert. And I said, me? And she <laughs> said, yeah, you. And, you know, I, I, I was raised with two brothers and, you know, I sang, but I didn't think anything of that. Mm -hmm. And so I sang, I'd like to teach the world to sing. And my brothers said actually to my parents, wow, Marianne has such a loud voice. <laughs> and that teacher had the wherewithal to pick up the phone at the uh, and call the seventh grade teacher. And she said, you have to watch for this, this young kid. There's something about her voice. It's just, you have to watch for her. Mm -hmm. So the seventh grade teacher did. And that was the start of that teacher really guiding me and nurturing me through high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I then, uh, went off to Manhattan School of Music. Um, unfortunately, Manhath Manhattan School of Music wasn't the right fit for me. I was only there for one semester. It was, I came from a teeny, teeny village in uh, in the uh, near Cabot, Pennsylvania, in Cabot, Pennsylvania, uh, which is near Saxonburg and whatnot. And it was too much for me. I was on 125th Street and Broadway uh, in 1981. And it just, it wasn't the right fit. So I left there and I went to Cincinnati Conservatory and I was there and I was very happy there. Um, uh, I was there two and a half years and unfortunately I became very ill with a terrible thyroid problem. And um, they decided that I needed to come home and I should take a year off. It was that bad. And so I, I had to have the radioactive iodine done on my thyroid and all of that but I I when I would sing I would like I would sing um, I'm dreaming I didn't have control of my voice and and it was all a, a thyroid problem so it took a year for that but I then was a year behind to going back to Cincinnati mm -hmm. but that was all right I was determined I called my teacher I wanted to go back but there was a part of me that was maybe insecure that I was now behind. Um, maybe that's, it was starting to, I was starting to wonder if this is really what I wanted to do. But anyway, I was going. And I was on my way to Cincinnati. I was 30 miles out of the city. And I stopped and I called my mom and my dad. And I was crying. I was very upset. And I said, you know, maybe this is not really what I want to do. And my mom said, but what happened? What made you think of that? She, I said, well, I don't know, maybe it's, I feel insecure. You know, it's later that I'm, I'm not now with all my, my uh, uh, student friends. And, and I, I just was making all kinds of excuses. And 
my mom tried to talk me out of coming back, but I just said, no, maybe this is not what I want to do. So I came home and my parents were sitting there in the middle of the night when I arrived and my mom and dad both said, oops, my mom and dad both said, um, listen, it's okay if you don't want to be an opera singer, but you have to have an education. You're going to get an education. Well, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no idea. All I did was music. And so I thought for a little while and finally I took an aptitude test. And wouldn't you know what's the first thing on that aptitude test? Music. music. And the second thing was was human services. I love people. I love, you know, communicating with people. And third was gardening and floristry. I was always in the yard with my dad. You know, my dad was always... We had all kind of prune trees and all pear trees. You know, he was an Italian. Mm -hmm. So I put the first two top two together and I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll be a speech pathology major instead of an opera singer. So I went to Penn State for a year. Holy moly. <laughs> Listen, algebra 2X plus 3Y means uh, 5Z. I, I could not, it was so hard for me, but I, it didn't matter. I was going and that's what I wanted to do now. And so I then heard that Duquesne University had a fantastic speech pathology degree, a program. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, maybe it was closer to home. I would try that. So I went, I talked to the a new administrator there and he said, my goodness, Marianne, you have all of these um, credits towards music. Why don't you finish your degree? And I said, no, 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 no. I'm done with opera. I'm done. I'm done. I don't want any more music. And he said, no, no, no. Really, you need to speech. You need to speak to the speech pathologist, uh, the advisor. And I said, OK. So I went and I spoke to her and she said, well, he gave you wrong information. You can't double major with two highly concentrated fields as music and speech pathology. So you have to make a decision. She said, I would suggest that you take the electives uh, on the side of speech pathology, but you do finish your music degree. I said, okay. So of course what happened, I started to sing again mm -hmm. and I started to study and I had my teacher and the bug bit me again mm -hmm. for a lack of a better term. And it started to come out mm -hmm. and people reacted, my gosh. And my teacher said, what are you doing in speech pathology? She said, Marianne, your voice, it's its so beautiful and you really should be studying. And, and, and I said, well, you know, I'm not so sure yet. And, and she knew, she knew that once I got started, to singing again and people were reacting and I was studying again, probably I would, you know, want to do it more. Well, about three months into studying, her name was Mia Novich. And this was the absolute why in my life, Viviana. I came in and I said, Mia, I'm very confused. I came here for speech pathology. I'm just finishing this to complete a degree. I said, but now that I'm singing, I I love it, but I know that I cannot eat, drink, and sleep 24-7 music. I don't, I have, I don't have an entourage. I thought, you know, I had to be like Maria Callas, that I didn't have an entourage, um, these kinds of things. And, and I said, I, I love so many other things. I love sports and I love horseback riding. And I love all of these things. And this was the, the, the absolute why in my life. My teacher came over to me and she grabbed me by the shoulders and she looked me square in the eye. And she said, Marianne, if you don't sing, it will haunt you the rest of your life because this is what you are meant to be doing. You know, I never looked back and my career went straight ahead. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing this journey and these struggles. 
with uh, with us and our audience because now you are extremely successful e affermata uh, all over the world. So people might take it for granted that someone chose that path and that was it. But in your case, you deviated from that path and then until much later you reunited with it as, you know, this is my calling and the world would have really missed a great time. If, <laughs> so uh, I don't know if your teacher Mia might be still with us or not, but we thank her for being indeed also that person that allowed you to, um, not that you needed to see your calling, but someone that really put the trust and knowledge in recognizing the uh, beautiful talent that uh, um, you eventually brought to the world. And that was going to be actually a part of my conversation today. And uh, maybe we'll talk for maybe a little less about the operas, but also what it takes to face this world because um, it's not easy. There are no guarantees. You have to go through rejections. You will have, uh, once you start making it, you're traveling, uh, you might have families. So that tug of war between a family commitments and a career. So it is really taxing, right? And oh. getting to the point of being able to uh, juggle everything successfully or at least <laughs> in an acceptable way for all. It takes really a lot of strength. You really, in addition to be passionate about your craft, you really have to be strong to make it. You are very wise. You're a very wise woman, Viviana, because many people think that being an opera singer is a very glamorous life. Um, it's glamorous on the stage in that, you know, it's what I love to do. It's it's my passion. Oh my goodness, I love to sing. But it's all of the other stuff around it that makes it very difficult. And I can tell you there, there were many, many times my teachers were, she was in New York. Uh, by the way, Mia Novich is no longer with us, but I refer to her all the time because I, I really know that she was put into my path by God, that that moment was a God incident, and I listened. But mm -hmm. uh, then the real work had to come, and that real work was the finances that are that it takes to maintain a career. That I was so blessed. Oh my gosh, Viviana, this city. Um, People rallied around me and helped me so much, whereas that doesn't happen so often anymore. You know, singers, it's costly. I was going every week to New York. I have lessons, double lessons. You know, back then, that was $300 an hour, mm -hmm. you know, and plus airfare, plus all of the travel, plus, you know, I stayed with friends. But the expense of being an opera singer is really really taxing and mm -hmm. I had five jobs at one time mm -hmm. I sang uh, I I was I worked at JC Penney's I sang at um a tree of life on Friday night as a a, a, a a quartet member on Saturday morning I sang at tree of life as uh, another quartet member on Saturday night I sang at St. Pete's in New Kensington as a cantor. And on Sunday morning, I was at Mount Lebanon Presbyterian Church. And I, but I was still doing it as uh, a singer, you know, a lot of that work. So I was very blessed to be able to do that. And then when I got into the Young Artist Program with Pittsburgh Opera, I, why people rallied around me to help me, people would, hand me a check for $10,000 and say, Marianne, please use this. Use this to go to New York. Use it for your expenses. We know how difficult it is. So that happened for several years. And I have to tell you, my love for this city and the people who have been so supportive of, uh, supportive of me for all of these 36 years 
and still going is really amazing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing that happened was I was very fortunate to be able to go right from the Young Artist Program with Pittsburgh Opera in 1993. I was there for three years and I got accepted at the Met. Mm -hmm. And I went in immediately in doing all of the small roles, the comprimario roles, and actually, Mama Lucia is one of those roles that I did at the Met during those five years that I was at the Met from 93 to 98, doing the small roles. But in the middle of that time period, I had uh, uh, an audition with Atlanta Opera, and they wanted, they were interested in me to sing Fenena in Nabucco, and it was a sort of a medium-sized role. And so I... I did it and my manager came back and he said, oh, they loved you and they offered me that role. Well, about three months later, they called and they said, uh, my manager called and said, well, you want the good news or the bad news? And I said, give me the bad news first. And he said, well, the bad news is they are not doing Nabucco as scheduled, but the good news is they want you to sing Adducena mm -hmm. from Trovatore. And I said, what? And I, my knees started to shake. I said, me? <laughs> no, I was singing all the small roles. Never did I think that I would sing Trovatore. Mm -hmm. And I took it. I said, I, I, I'm going to take it to New York. I went to my teacher in New York and she said, this is like a glove. This will be your repertoire. And it was. And so in 98, when the Met offered me a list of all the small roles that they wanted me to do, I said to them, I said, thank you very much. I'm so appreciative of this, but I'm going to try my wigs, it, wings in the bigger repertoire. And that's when it really took off. That is uh, that is uh, fantastic. So let's talk a little bit about how you uh, prepare for a challenging uh, role. If you have a process, if you have specific rituals, techniques uh, uh, you used to get into character. Oh, my gosh. Well, one of the things that is something that I truly believe in, rehearsal is rehearsal, right? We want to rehearse. I believe that you do all of the work before you get to the rehearsal period in the theater, in the opera house, that you do all of your technical work and preparing of the music uh, with your teacher, with your coaches. That is absolutely uh, really important. In fact, when I did that first Azucena, I took nine months to prepare for mm -hmm. that role because it was such a huge role. In fact, Aida or Amneris from Aida, um, Eboli from Don Carlo, and Azucena from Trovatore, I took nine months to prepare these roles because these are really difficult roles. And I wanted to get it right from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So all of that prep work is before you get to the theater. And then when you get to the theater, that to me is the time that you don't mark. You sing in voice. You know, many times singers will try to save them. No, I want to, to build and put on a layer every day that I'm in rehearsals to build myself up with all the movimenti and all, you know, all of the staging uh, that happens during um, the, your your time with it before you go on stage mm -hmm. um, for the performance. So I believe that you have to work yourself up very, very slowly every day and sing out. I do not believe in marking down an octave or, you know, I, I believe that you have to build yourself up with the stamina. And uh, uh, that's how I work. I also, um, before every every performance, I always, in the theater, you'll never see me warming up in my dressing room. I have to find my own spot in the theater somewhere where it's quiet. I have my own space. Um, you know, people get really nervous and, you know, they come knocking at your door and want to wish you toy, toy, toy or in Boca Lupo and, and I'm not there and they... And so I always have to tell them, listen, I'm in my place. I have to warm up. I just need to come into my and focus on 
my performance and warm up. I warm up for an hour and a half. Wow. Very slowly. Yes. Um, and so those are the, some of the things that, that I have done. Uh, eating, I usually eat something, maybe some pasta, like five hours before. Never near the time that I sing. Oh, I, I, when you're full, it's so hard to breathe, you know. Um, but I, another thing that really is a fascinating to many people is once I start, I, I drink a lot of water every day. But once I start to warm up, I never take another drop of water until the show is over. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. No. yeah. So, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that, um, you know, you, you have to watch. One of the things, Viviana, that as a singer, and Marilyn Horn told me this a long, long, long time ago. She said, Marianne, I used to not speak the day, the entire day of my performance. Mm -hmm. And I took that one step further. I stopped talking the day before at around five or four or five o'clock. I don't speak anymore until the show is over. Because mm -hmm. talking is something that we just do. We don't think about supporting the sound or anything like that. So I don't, you'll never see me out. Um, I'm very quiet before uh, the day before and the day of the show. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really stick to it because um, I can say this and I, it, it's not bragging or anything, but I can say that I have never canceled one performance in 36 years wow that's uh that's really it speaks to your professionalism because it doesn't yeah. mean that you were not uh or didn't want to but uh you just uh so talking a little bit about marilyn horn uh she's also a, a mezzo soprano and also her yes. roles uh, require beauty or tone and excellent breast support she's uh i think from bradford pennsylvania she's another uh, yes. pennsylvanian talent is there a little episode that has to do with some shoes? Uh, <laughs> wow. I was going to have shoes, right? <laughs> oh, my God. You have done your homework. Oh, my goodness <laughs> sakes. Well, my voice teacher, uh, Dori Portero, who, by the way, her teacher was Toti del Monte, yes. very famous uh, soprano. Um, anyway. Dodie, my teacher, was very good friends with Marilyn, and they sang together uh, a lot in uh, uh, Germany. And uh, so Dodie said, Marianne, I want you, uh, after I had sung the Trovatore that I'd spoken to you about in, in Atlanta, I immediately got my very first Amneris in Aida the following year. So I was preparing for that, and my teacher said, she said, Marianne, I really want you to um, speak to, have a lesson with Marilyn Horn. I want her to hear your Amneris because she sang the role. And I said, oh my gosh, this would be so cool. So we got together and I sang uh, for an hour and that was how we rented the hall. And then we had to move on and, and she was giving me great um, information. And she said, Marianne, this is like a glove. This your voice is the perfect voice for this kind of repertoire. She actually said, uh, you know, I sang Verdi, but it really wasn't right for me. I did it, but she said, uh, Amneris I did much more than than Trovatore. She said Trovatore was just not right for her. But anyway, she gave me great, great um stuff. And at the end of that hour, she turned to my teacher and she said, Dodie, I don't know what you're doing today, Marianne. I'm not sure what you're doing for the rest of the day, but I am free. If you would like to go back to, if Dodie, if you're available, back to your apartment, I would like to continue working. We worked for another four hours. Wow. It, mm -hmm. I was in heaven, heaven, that, that Marilyn Horn wanted to continue to do this. So... I then worked with her a couple more times. I went to DC and whatnot. And, and uh, after one of the coaching, she said to me, she said, Marianne, you know what? This is going to be your role. I am telling you, you just sing this fantastically. 
And she said, you know, would you like to wear my first pair of Aida shoes? And I said, are you serious? She said, absolutely, I am. Well, they were like this high. For those because of you who watch the Four Kinds of Podcasts, um, like very high. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I thought, oh my gosh. So I took them, I, 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 I got into them and I thought, oh my goodness, I'll break my neck in these because they like were so hot. <laughs> oh yeah, being on stilts, exactly, because she was quite short. But the <laughs> fact that she gave those to me is absolutely something I will continue to always treasure. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you the question first, and then we're I'm going to read a couple of words from our sponsor. The question is, is on one hand, but uh, think, uh, thinking that your career spans 36 years, uh, it might be a little more challenging to pinpoint the exact uh, event or episode. But uh, I was wondering if you can share with us a particularly memorable performance experience or a moment on stage that stands out to you. Uh, you have been, you know, the, the Metropolitan uh, Opera, La Scala, the Royal Opera House, the Vienna Opera, uh, the Vienna State Opera, uh, China. You have been all over the world. So that's why I said the challenge might be to pinpoint uh, the exact moment or audience, you know, maybe a, a, a reaction from an audience that you were not expecting. Um, but I'll give you a couple of minutes. Applying for Great. Italian citizenship? Need documents translation? Istituto Mondo Italiano provides certified translations and assistance services. Be sure to visit us at istitutomondoitaliano.org and schedule your free consultation. Un caffè, per favore. My first cup of coffee <clears throat> sets the tone for my entire day, and I get my coffee at La Prima Espresso. La Prima has been brewing Pittsburgh's best coffee for over 35 years. Try any of their in-house roasted varieties of beans from all over the world at home, or come and enjoy an espresso or a cappuccino at any of their locations, where their friendly baristas and familiar faces will make you feel at home. This is to get espresso coffee at your door. Okay, so back to you, Marianne. You know, uh, that's a tricky question. It's hard because I have so, so many fabulous experiences but there are two there are really uh and one was at the very beginning of my career and one was in the the really the middle of my career and they're both in Italy um two days before I was to to make my debut in the arena in Verona singing Aida my mother was killed in a car accident mm -hmm. and this was really a a horrific time in, in my life. Uh, I was supposed to leave to go uh, for rehearsals. And of course, my world, uh, my whole family, my father and my brothers, were our, our lives were turned upside down. But my dad said, you have to go. You must go. Your mom and I worked so hard to get you, you know, uh, this opportunity and, and your mother would not want you to do anything but go so two weeks later I go to Verona and I didn't know anybody it was my debut first time I was in Italy oh my gosh I can't even tell you the heartbreak uh and the how difficult it was calling my dad every day and he was just struggling so badly and I was struggling so badly but I knew I had to do this and um it was funny because when I going back to the wonderful people here in Pittsburgh that have supported me uh, so much eight months before, when everybody knew that I was going to go to Verona, there were 20 people that were coming over and wouldn't you know it, they came over and they were uh, my support, you know, uh, for those, for a couple of those performances. And, um, but I can remember that opening night that I had. First of all, the arena in Verona is, holds 26,000 people. And what they didn't tell me was when it starts at 9.15 at night, you know, it's open air. It's the most beautiful setting in this over 2,000 year old arena. I didn't know that everybody has a candle 
a little candelina and they didn't tell me that so when i come on stage and i'm the almost the first one on stage oh i almost missed my cue because it was like oh my god yeah, yeah, just, yeah it was it was I, I literally almost missed my cue because I was so overwhelmed what I saw and that evening thank you God went so excuse me went so well and I sang so well but the thing that really was a moment for me at total opposite ends of each other when I came out for my applause, how as I'm standing there, of course, the tears are running down my face and the audience was so warm and kind. Nobody knew, nobody knew what had happened to me or my mother. But I, as I'm standing there, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is the happiest moment in my career but the saddest moment in my life. Mm -hmm. And to have that just unbelievable feeling was, it was so overwhelming. And then when I came out of the arena, there were those 20 people who just picked me up and they took me, you know, there was a party at the Piazza Bra. And, you know, it's funny because how things, you can't imagine how they're going to turn out and that situation just became one of the most um, memorable moments in my career. It was at the very, it was in 1998. It was really, really, really a memorable, memorable moment. The other mem memorable moment was when I sang Santuzza mm -hmm. at La Scala. Oh. And I was singing um Cavalleria Rusticana and the Italians truly believe um that only uh, 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 an Italian can sing uh Cavalleria because it's so it's the temperamento and all of this and I guess with the name Cornetti it helped because <laughs> they <laughs> they wanted me to do this and it was such a, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful um, production. And I did not know this, but I was hired as the only American to ever sing the role of Santuzza at La Scala. Wow. And those people <clears throat> so stomped their feet. Mm -hmm. You know how difficult La Scala can be with the Logione and, and whatnot, you know, they're a very critical uh, theater, but on the on the opposite of that, they, they're so warm. It was a moment, and I, as I'm coming off the stage, my manager and the Direttore Artistico was standing, they were bawling. They were absolutely bawling. So that was a moment for me that was a very proud, 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 proud moment. I can't really. imagine. And you have, uh, before we move into talking about the Pittsburgh Festival Opera, you have taken upon yourself uh, studying those languages because, you know, there is kind of sometimes a misunderstanding that because people have to sing in those languages, they necessarily become fluent. Now, the, the becoming fluent is a personal commitment that someone decides to pursue or not. Um, yes. I have uh, another student, uh, Betsy, uh, who is in the production as well. Uh, on her first Italian class, she said, I can read Italian beautifully, but, and obviously she knows what she's singing, but it's like, I don't speak it. But on the other hand, you have taken upon yourself to master, uh, what other languages um, have you pursued in addition to Italian? Well, the first language that I studied in school, high school was um, in Hochschule was uh, German. Mm -hmm. I took German for we had a wonderful German teacher again he was a fantastic teacher and I wanted to 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 take German mm -hmm. uh, and I did and he was a fantastic teacher so I speak pretty darn good uh, German also I took one year of French um, and that's probably the the language that I least know but I still can converse and whatnot um, but Italian for me was 
really important because I sang in that language so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. That I needed, um, I really learned, you know, they say you need to go to Italy to learn it. And it really helps. You know, I've um, the majority of my career has been in, the, in Italy. <laughs> and I learned on the street. I made a lot of mistakes. Whoa, did I make mistakes? <laughs> But um, that's how you I'm learn. I'm working on my English yourself. So. <laughs> <laughs> Although you speak beautiful English. Oh, my goodness sakes. But, uh, yeah, the language, knowing the language is so important, especially as a singer, because even if it's in antiquated, uh, you know, language, like antiquated Italian or whatever, you can understand it. And that mm -hmm. is so, you don't have to be always translating, you know, as you're singing. And it's really, really, really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think it, it gives you, you know, a better understanding of the cultural context of the work that oh. the works you're interpreting. And then you always had an interest in musical theater and participating in production. So you're overall bringing a full, full character onto the stage. It's not just one or the other. And that's why I think the audience uh, um, receives uh, that and responds to that with uh, uh, standing ovations uh, anywhere you oh. have uh, sang. Yeah, it's the language is, is without the words, we have nothing, just the sound. Mm -hmm. So we need the language. You need to you need to know what to what words to emphasize, what words to color. Uh, and you can tell someone who has been around that language uh, compared to somebody who is not. That's, mm -hmm. that's just the way it is. Okay. So let's talk about uh, some uh, emerging uh, artists. Uh, tell me a little bit about the Pittsburgh Festival uh, Opera. Yes, that was uh, a real um, uh, surprise to me in 2019 mm -hmm. uh, when they came to me and said, we understand that you know, uh, you might be interested in being a, an artistic director at some point in your career. And I said, well, yeah, I, but not now. <laughs> and they said, I said, so is there something going on? And they said, well, we, we, they were losing their artistic director. Oops. And they were interested in maybe to see if I might be interested in the position. And I said, well, tell me a little bit about it. So I met with the, uh, um, Dr. Eugene Myers and spoke about it. And I was on my way to uh, Beijing to sing mm -hmm. Trovatore. And so he said, would would you be interested in maybe uh, putting your application? And I said, sure, why not? I said, as long as you permit me to continue to sing, I'll be interested in doing this. So I got the job. And I they I started in December of 2019, and of course, what we know the world started to go. <laughs> the world stopped in March, mm -hmm. and but I and it was really rough for Pittsburgh Festival Opera, um, you know, trying to keep things going, trying to keep things visible. I said, you, even though there's a pandemic, we have to do something that keeps us out there. We have to do videos we have to and we did that we did all of that um and then it, it got really tricky in 21 and uh unfortunately we had to lay people off and there was just two of us then mm -hmm. and i was still artistic director and um it got even more difficult in 22 um and we lost our executive director and then i just kept it going um until, I mean, till ne just recently in April, I started to hire uh, a staff again. But mm -hmm. um, I was determined to keep Pittsburgh Festival Opera going. Of course, you know, Mildred Miller Posvar was a fantastic uh, a Pittsburgher here in the in the, the city. And of course, she was an incredible artist. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to keep this this company, you know, alive. And so I did. I carried it on my back for about a year and a half, just me. But then we were fortunate enough to get some money. And now I am uh, changing it or going in the direction of concert opera. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm doing concert opera, Viviana, is because the costs of 
opera is so expensive. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's so expensive. And I can bring in very fine singers and do a, a, an entire opera with orchestra and the singers. And it's maybe a tenth of what the cost would be if it were a, a full production. Mm -hmm. And so my first um, go at it was our Adriana Lecouvreur, which was in September here um, at Carnegie Music Hall. And it was a smashing success. I'm very happy about that. Mm -hmm. It had never been done in Pittsburgh and since mm, 1984 or something like that. People didn't remember it. And it is, it's one of my absolute most favorite operas. I've sung it all over Italy. Mm -hmm. I've sung the role of Principessa di Bouillon all over Italy. And Chilea was a fantastic composer and he nailed it with this beautiful opera. Mm -hmm. And I was very glad to present it to Pittsburgh. Okay, so uh, a couple of more questions before we move into some fun facts and uh, and then we'll uh, we'll tell our audience uh, where they can see you next. We'll, um, we'll also give them a, a code so that they can access to 50% off the tickets. Uh, but okay. the question um, that I had for you, um, how to entice and invite people to come to the opera if they're first time goers. Uh, maybe there might be some pieces that might make someone more likely to come back or maybe a body system. So tell us a little bit what might be some good, a good approach to get someone exposed to or maybe debunk some myths about uh, the opera to be just, uh, you know, um, so tell us a little bit about also some of the strategies you might implement to get uh, to engage the uh, community with the opera. Well, I truly believe that, you know, many, many people are, um, they don't come because of the, the lack of knowledge of the uh, language. They, well, it's in a different language. Well, we can't say that for that excuse anymore because we have all of the, uh, surtitles now. And the surtitles are tremendously helpful. In fact, it was Beverly Sills and Tito Capobianco mm -hmm. who started them. Yeah. And so it's brilliant. It's around the whole world now. There's surtitles in every theater around the world. Um, and so there's no excuse for that uh, because you don't need to know the language. The other thing is people... Um, I, I can, I, some people would always say it's an acquired taste, uh, the opera. I think you have to just get yourself into the theater and allow yourself to listen to this glorious, glorious music. Mm -hmm. If we can get people into the seats, I know they're going to enjoy it. I know it because the music of most of the operas that we do are, is so beautiful. And what we're, we're wanting to do is get more of the young mm -hmm. uh, uh, professionals into or the younger kids into uh, the opera because they need to continue to keep to keeping the art form alive, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's so many that uh, music has sort of disappeared in our elementary schools, which is very sad. Mm -hmm. But we have to continue to try to uh, reach out to those those younger kids. And I have to say with Pittsburgh Festival Opera, we have an incredible education uh, area that we we are taking around Hansel and Gretel to many schools around the area. And the mm -hmm. kids absolutely love it. They love it. And of course it's a cut down version. Uh, so you have to, have to make it fun for mm -hmm. uh, of course the kids, um, for the adults, I think it's it's a it's a people think that it's an elitist art form. It is not. It is not. Everybody can enjoy opera. They just have to get into the theater to to understand it and listen to it. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, you know, we're always trying to enhance our audiences. And and it's it's a it's a um, I think we have a pretty good handle of it here in Pittsburgh. Um, and we just try to continue to touch those people. And of course, it's better if you know somebody in the cast. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and also maybe, um, you know, for instance, uh, we um, at Istituto Mondo Italiano, prior to the operas, we like to get personal, so to speak, like, for instance, at this one time, we have this uh, honor to speak with you directly, and we'll talk about the upcoming operas. In the past, we have had people that introduce us to some of the uh, musical parts that will introduce what the main protagonists were going to do <clears throat> and what emotions that those notes will lead to because the opera is a story that is just been just just been sang I mean I don't want to I don't yeah. want to but um so knowing what the plot because they can be a little intricate sometimes you have also people in disguise first they come out as a man and then they become a woman oh, yes. and then this <laughs> is the the Anna uh, uh, the uh, child of <laughs> so oh, yeah. but that's part of you know the uh that's part of the fun to kind of decode who is who and then um you know eventually follow the story and uh um and i think uh doing a little bit of a homework so that it's not just like reading the uh appreciating doing a little bit of a homework i think it might be a, a little secret so um a couple of fun facts uh, you are a diehard uh, Pittsburgh Steelers fan, is that correct? <laughs> I am a diehard Pittsburgh Steeler, Pittsburgh Pirate, and Pittsburgh Penguin fan. Oh my <laughs> goodness. I usually sing every year uh, for the Steelers and the Pirates. Absolutely the anthem. Love, <laughs> love, love, love. I'm in fantasy football and oh my gosh, all of that stuff. <laughs> Wonderful. Love it been very very active and uh in uh, some of the events and also you're quite a an adventurous cook tell us a little bit about your enthusiasm towards uh, uh food and uh uh if you have any uh dishes that are your uh, piatti forti your kind of your strongest dishes uh, tell us a little bit let's say i'm i'm not so adventurous in uh, in cooking it but i'm adventurous in eating it Oh my gosh, there is nothing better than fabulous. And I, I tell you, um, my mother was not, sorry, mom, <laughs> but my <laughs> mother was not the greatest Italian cook. But when I went to Italy and I really tasted what Italian food is like, oh my goodness sakes, I, there's no place that you find a cappuccino Mm -hmm. on this earth than in Italy that you cannot that you just can't you can't copy it there's mm -hmm. something about the cappuccini in Italy that is so perfect to me mm -hmm. pasta is so perfect I one of my most favorite dishes is to go to Genoa mm -hmm. and have pasta pesto Okay, so next, uh, if uh, we were just at the uh, hometown homegrown uh, event organized by Good Taste Pittsburgh, and I was actually showing, we made pasta from 10 o'clock until 3 p.m. nonstop. There were three of us, and I was oh. actually doing the hand roll trophy, uh, which is usually oh. apple pasta goes with pesto. So next time, I'll make sure to <laughs> to bring you, you some. You know what? I love it so much with the potatoes and the, oh, the, the, beans, potatoes. the green beans. That's the, oh, the authentic. Oh, uh, um, oh people gosh. cannot um, even phantom how the addition of these two ingredients make that recipe from great to spectacular. So oh, mm -hmm. It is so spectacular. Mm -hmm. I also love um, uh, the Bolognese in Bologna with the pizzelli. Oh, yeah. my gosh. <laughs> I love it. You know, I and go to Palermo. Oh, the food there is, is spectacular too. Oh my gosh. Okay, I, so I've been keeping you for uh, for about an hour. I know that you have also more birthday celebrations to attend, but we have this double feature of Cavalleria Rusticana and Pagliacci and Adelchers, the, uh, a double feature, uh, jealousy, revenge. Uh, tell if you, uh, in a nutshell, a little bit, um, what the uh, audience is going to be in for as far as some of the characters or the story. Um, I will give some dates. I will give out the, the, the coupon to get discounted tickets, but tell us what the audience should be looking forward to. Well, this, this as I said earlier, this opera to me is one of the, the operas that is so near and dear to me because I love first 
and foremost, the music. The music in Cavalleria Rusticana is so beautiful and absolutely so sad also at the same time. Um, but it's glorious that the way Mascagni wrote this this opera, it, it's, it's just, I love it so much. I really do. Um, you're getting a lot of, um, you know, jealousy, jealousia. You're getting a lot of, um, uh, unfortunately, you know, poor Santuzza is a, a victim of Turidu having an affair with Lola. And Lola, of course, is married to Alfio. And when that all is unearthed, and and the thing about Santuzzi is she's with, uh, she's pregnant with Torido's Torido's um, baby, um, and all of that is unearthed by Santuzza trying to tell Mamma Lucia what her son is has been doing but she never comes out and says anything about him she says me, me la rapito she meaning lola took him away from me mm -hmm. and she blames it on lola instead of saying turidu did this to me and mama lucia is she thinks you know how dare you do this on a on easter sunday come to me and tell me all these problems. It's a holiday, you know, and it's the most uh, religious day of the, the calendar year for Italian or for uh, uh, Christians. And um, so Mama Lucia doesn't um, really give her any satisfaction of like, she's going to help her. And then Santuzza is just at her wits end because Turidu just won't listen to her. She loves him and he doesn't want any more parts of her. So she then tells Alfio and Alfio being the husband of Lola, he now knows what Lola did by having an, an affair with uh, Turidu. And you know, one of the most Italian things is when somebody bites somebody's ear, you know that this is a fight and somebody's going to probably die. And so they had this uh, duel, uh, this confrontation. You never see it. But at the end, of course, you hear Anno Amazzato Comparitoridu. And that is, that scream is so, it, it goes through you like a knife. Mm -hmm. Um and it's such a sad story. It's a, it's a fantastic uh, opera for the chorus. The chorus sings this, you know, the Inne Jamo, which is, oh my gosh, one of the most beautiful pieces of music written for big chorus. But the chorus and Pittsburgh Opera's chorus is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And they sing all of this music uh, all through an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, they have a lot of the music in, in this opera. And believe me, it is it is absolutely glorious music. And then you get that, and then you go to Pagliacci, which is another fantastic Leon Caballo's uh, opera, which is also very beautiful, but totally different. Um, so it's Cavalleria and Pagliacci go together a lot as they're two short operas, uh, and but it is action packed with emotion and jealousy and and. Of course, somebody dies in both of them. That's <laughs> so, <awesome. laughs> so for those of you who are interested in joining us um, and obviously uh, hearing the beautiful voice of Marianne Cornetti, Cavalleria Rusticane and Pagliacci, this double feature will open on November the 9th. It will repeat on the 12th, which is Tuesday. That's where we, you can catch all the Instituto Mundo Italiano students. So be part of, that, uh, of it because after there is a, an after opera talk, Mariana has made herself available. Um, and then uh, November 15th and the 17th. If you're watching this episode or if you're listening to this episode, 
Istituto Mondo Italiano is happy to extend a coupon code to get you tickets at 50% off. The coupon code is P-O-I-M-I. -I. One more time, P-O-I-M-I. -I. We love to see you numerous. Bring your friends, bring your neighbors, bring everyone to the opera. It will not be your last one. So unfortunately, our time together is up. Il Big Ben ha detto stop. And it's time for us uh, to say arrivederci e alla prossima. We want to thank you for tuning in into the program. If you have any questions or comments or if you have any topics you would like us to address, please contact us at, Italian, at italianradiohour at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. And remember, if you or uh, any of your feminine friends have missed a prior episode or would like to listen to this episode again, Subscribe to the Italian Radio Hour on YouTube or where you catch your favorite podcast. I would profusely like to thank my guest, Marianne Cornetti, to make herself available, especially on her birthday. Uh, I can't wait to see you in rehearsal rooms tomorrow night. Thank you to our sponsors, Istituto Mondo Italiano and La Prima Espresso. Until next time, alla prossima. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao.